If you lose an ovary, uh, we have to pay you this money. If you, you know, lose a kidney, it's this amount of money. If, you know, you do this, I mean, like we actually put a price tag, sadly, in the contract that if something happens to the surrogate while you're going through this process, we pay this amount. We actually had to take out a life insurance policy on the surrogate just in case something happens. I don't think people have any idea that there's so much, uh, there's so many layers to this. Everyone who's watching or tuning in on YouTube, maybe listening, you you know Shanti, you probably know his husband, Scott, but do you really know them and do you really know their birth story? And something we're going to do that's, I think, super interesting. I don't know if anyone knows the full story, but not just a birth story, we're going to hear about the conception story, the questions that people have asked. I know they ask me. Um, thinking that I'm going to give them inside information. I'm like, you know, this isn't my story to tell, but it's such a beautiful story. And so when we went out to dinner recently, I said, I know my audience would love to hear this. I know so many people could be inspired by it. I think a lot of people struggle with fertility and having kids and how that impacts relationships. And then to have a whole nother layer added to it, the fact that you are gay parents, the fact that you really did struggle. I just want to share the whole story. And so if we can, first of all, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. <laughs> Give him some bass. I will tell the Give him some bass. I have I love recording in the morning because I have bass. I will tell every listener out there if you hear me sneeze or cough or blow my nose in this lovely time. <laughs> it's because I'm a dad and my kids get sick all the time. Right. I mean, I so relate to that. Once they start being around other kids and out in the world, they just are little germ pools. Yes. Exactly. Good times. But I also there's something about it that I'm just like, yes, because I'm like, OK, well, my immune system is getting something that I never got before. So I ain't, I'm not going to get it again if I go to the park anyway. <laughs> Let's start with the two of you, if we can. Um, how long have you been married and how did you meet? Hold on. OK, here it comes. <laughs> I thought I was going to sneeze. I always touch it like if I sneeze. We've been married for, it'll be 12 years, October 12th. Years. Are you kidding me? No, it'll be 12 Tw- years. Uh, yeah. October 12th. No, it'll be 10 years. Oh, we'll be together 12 Matt, years. He's very pretty. He cannot be smart and pretty <laughs> at the same time. Well, I felt like I married him on the first day I met him. Yeah. Okay. I felt like we were married on the very first day. Uh, we met, uh, it's pretty much a gay hookup site. You know what I'm saying? It was Keep like it we, we were in New York City and it was it was late one evening and we were feeling some kind of way, I guess, feeling some kind of way in two different spots of the city. Oh, we were both in relationships <laughs> and we needed a needed well, a release. Well, you were both in relationships at the time? Yes, we were. I, I did was... not know that piece. A lot yes. of people don't. We but were, we're telling I, you. Yeah, okay. I was with someone for like six years. You were with someone for a little bit. And, uh, you know, we needed a release. Yeah. But, you know, it's so interesting because it it sounds very like risque and like scandalous. But for me, I was just in a situation where I had actually spoken to the person I was with a few times about just where we were in a relationship and they weren't. You know, they were just like holding me back. And so instead of breaking up first, I did that first. And then and uh, I was in a relationship where I was like, oh. So this is what it's going to that my parents have been married for 50 years. So this is what it's going to be like. And this is what mm. I'm supposed to do. And I don't mean it in a bad way, but that's just what I was. I don't mean trained, but that's just what I was thought it was going to happen. So Scott, um, you came out um, much later in your life. I mean, Sean, I think you've probably shared the story on your podcast. And I'm going to link to a couple of those because I remember you guys did a series. I don't know if they're still up where we like really got to understand who Scott is and his, his history, his background, um, you know, soccer, his professional sports, et cetera, yeah. a little bit about his upbringing. But am I correct in remembering you came out much later in life? Correct. I didn't actually come out to my parents until I say 34, but I feel like I didn't come out, come out until I was 38 and when I met him. So, because I didn't feel, uh, again, when I was younger back in 1824 uh 
it just wasn't acceptable, uh, especially being an athlete. Uh, it just wasn't. And so for me, my memories are, you know, Martina Navratilova, Billie Jean King, both being ostracized for being gay. And so I was like, I'm never going to come out. And mm. hopefully I was just going to will this and wish this away. And um, the relationship that you were in at the time you met Sean, were your parents aware of that? They were. Um, I uh, was with someone before that relationship and he was like, I want to meet your parents and you're coming out. And I was like, Eek. Uh, <laughs> so I did. And I remember the conversation. I think my parents were in a holiday inn on 57th between 9th and 10th and they were visiting and um, they, they said, uh, uh, I said, so mom and dad, I have to tell you something. This is like 10 o'clock at night. And I was like, Oh, I got to tell them because they wanted, my ex was like, I need to meet them tomorrow. And I'm like, great. Um, so I said, I'm in a non-traditional relationship and, uh, I've met someone that, uh, I think you should probably meet. And dad was like, Oh, okay. And I said, I'm gay. And dad was like, okay. I kind of knew for like four or five years. I hate that comment. I hated it, but he was well, trying to be supportive. Happened. And uh, mom started crying. She cried, she cried for about six months or so. But, you know, mm. she said it was because I just always knew you were special and I just didn't want you to be unhappy. So, you know, and everything worked out. Can but that was 34. If you, if you don't mind, because we've done some episodes on like things not to say. Um, what was it about your father saying I, I knew that bothered you? I think, well, I know it was because since I was a kid, everyone was always like, you're gay, you're gay, you're gay. And I'm like, how are people like, I'm not wearing a shirt. I'm not, I don't, I don't dress in females clothes. I don't run around, you know, back in the day, it was like running like this or whatever. So all the, the things that were out running like what, you know, people were, Oh my God. That's back in the day, you know, in 1864. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, I didn't think anything that I was doing that was giving off that vibe. And apparently I was, and it bothered me. So I went to the other end of the spectrum. I was like, I'm going to play sports. I'm going to be really good at sports. I'm going to, you know, do all these things that show that I'm not. And, mm -hmm. uh, so when people said, oh, we knew, and I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what was it that I was doing that was saying that I was gay? Yeah. So, yeah. But, so it was frustrating for, for my dad to be or friends or my brother or, you know, just people who said it because um, they did was, um, you know, oh, we knew. And I'm like, but I tried so hard to not. Yeah, do anything. that's so. interesting. So it's, you know, probably a, a personal thing. Maybe, Sean, I don't know if anyone you were much younger when you came out. Go ahead. Blow that nose of yours. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Do it. <laughs> you let it all out. Get it. <laughs> We are definitely keeping it real. And my dogs are running around in the background and they're, they're both, they both have Alzheimer's. So who knows what could happen on the show today, <laughs> right? But um, the, I mean, do you remember people saying that to you? Like, oh, we knew, or did you not really even come out? It was just like, this is who I am. Who, me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I pretty much, like I really didn't care because, you know, I have, my mother, when we were younger, I mean, she had some really prophetic things to say. And one of the things that she was, she always taught us was just like, number one, not everybody's going to like you. There's too many people in the world for you to be worried about whether someone doesn't like you. And, you know, I knew she had gay friends. They weren't out, but my mom was friends with, every, my mom was friends with the, with the person, you know, stocking the shelves at 3 a.m., at this grocery store. Like she just talked to everybody. So I never, there was never really um, a fear of being myself around my, my mother. Uh, my grandparents were, my grandfather was a pastor of a church. So that was a little bit tougher, mm -hmm. but I just always had this foundation of, I only know what it's like to be me. And so I, that's the only thing I know. This is the only thing I know. I was teased like, in third grade for being gay, but I kind of put that to a halt really quick because I was like, well, you can't beat me. So like, what you gonna do? Like, you wanna fight? <laughs> Cause you know, I'm like, okay, so you're teasing me. So, okay, so you wanna fight? Cause just because I personally know that I'm gay. First of all, I was, and I don't mean to boast about this but I was the fastest kid in class. I was always picked for, you know, kickball first. Like, you know, it's not like I was weak or anything. It was just something, you know, 
kids just wanted to see. And I'm just like, okay. So that really went out the window very quickly. So you never, was, even as a kid, didn't try to cover it up. You didn't say, no, I'm not. You didn't try to pretend that you weren't or. No, I was just every, every time I got teased for it, I just was kind of like, what the fuck do you want me to do? You know, like, so I, I didn't have that. I didn't have that. Um, The mindset wasn't obviously the same as a, a 43 year old mature man now yeah. with like, like, lots of confidence, but foundationally I was like, what, first of all, I was always ready to fight. Cause that's just kind of where I grew up. It was just like, okay, well we can handle this with our hands. But in addition mm -hmm. to that, you know, I was just like, so it was more like, so what, what are you going to do? And then, yeah. um, so when I came out at 20, my, the only, the tough part, toughest part for me coming out was to my grand, my grandfather, because he was, you know, my biggest inspiration. And, you know, we, I was in church, like, you know, at least three times a week. And so it was more of like the religious aspect that was scary. It was like, you're going to hell and all this stuff. So that was the only thing that was that really impacted my like ability to re be super free. But then once my grandfather found out, you know, he just said, I was in a relationship with somebody. He said, we need to talk about that relationship you're having with that boy. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, girl, um, you know, but I was like, you know, I, and I wasn't like necessarily like a super flamboyant kid or anything, but I was just like, okay. So, and you know, I, also when I was in high school, you know, I was a boy, so I had boys over and there was one boy that I was definitely being fast with. <laughs> and I think my grandfather knew. And so he didn't quite know how to handle it. I don't think, you totally. know, because we, yeah. you know, he had only had girls before they took me in. So, but anyway, I, say all that to say my grandfather was the toughest my mother was the easiest and my brother was super easy as well mm -hmm. and so um yeah like we had we always talk about it and it, he brings it up still a lot and I'm just like wow who brings it, it up a lot he I brings do. up <clears throat> the gay thing and how much it impacted him so young I imagine and, and I and I um I relate to it because I understand it. Like I definitely was teased and bullied and stuff, but I handled it differently. Mm. You know, he kept quiet and tried to hide it and tried to sweep it away. it away. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, my whole thing was like, so what you want to do? You know, so yeah. Um, but I think like additionally, like, you know, he helped me because just being a little bit more sympathetic and empathetic to his story, because I was always like, well, you, everybody should be ever to be who they are. Mm -hmm. And then I think my story gave him some power to be like, oh, 100%. Okay. I remember, <clears throat> I have told the story several times. I remember there that we, we were in our car on Roosevelt Island in New York City, and um, we we're talking to his mom. And uh, she said, our Tiana, his sister came home crying because some boy didn't like her didn't want to be her friend and i told her i was like there are so many other fish in the sea what do you care about why are you wasting your tears on this person when there's so many other people that can be your friends and i i'm driving i'm literally fell out of my seat i was like well this may have not been the first time i've heard it the way she delivered it and the way she the the moment that i was in i was it literally knocked my head off and i was like wow i never thought about it like that and well I don't like everyone. So why does everyone have to like me? And so it just completely changed my life. My mom literally walks around with the headspace of like, Sha, ain't nobody worried about you. Mm. Like that's, I feel like that's <laughs> just, I feel like that's constantly going on in the back of her head, you know, cause there's still drama in my family. Don't get it yeah. twisted. There's drama, mm -hmm. it's, you know, but I just feel like in my mom's head, like the soundtrack at the back of her mind is like, Sha, you know, I worry about you, girl, yeah. you know, just like and I laugh. I think she's funny. So, yeah. you know, it brought a little bit of humor to actually my ability to come out. So when you guys did meet, um, at, first of all, did you both have a dream to be married and have children and start a family? Married you, before you met each other, I would say marry. Yes. Kids, no, like that wasn't in my um, deck of cards. <laughs> I was like, I got too many things to do and I'm too wild for that nonsense. And I'm still too wild for it. <laughs> Facts. 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 I don't know about you. that. Uh, well, again, being raised 
so long ago, it was never an option to be married. It was never an option to have kids. So for me, I was going to marry a female and I'm going to live next door to the guy that I was going to be with. And the woman that he was going to be married to was the lesbian lover of my wife. And so what we were going to do is have made neighboring houses and we had a um, tunnel that we were going to cross under underneath at night so that we could be with our spouses. And so we could sleep with our respective lovers. But when the day came, we would go back under the tunnel and wake up when we'd have, you know, two heterosexuals. Is this really a childhood fantasy you had? It was, it's legit legit like i was this is how we were gonna fix it because um i i am not i am not uh i can't be gay i don't want to be gay and um it's not acceptable so that was like that was the definition of keep it on the down low underground but you know so it's i was gonna say it's just so um interesting you say that because even sometimes the way, well, not now necessarily, but the way you used to process like that type of stuff was just so complicated. I was like, why are you complicated? I complicate things in my mind, but in a different way, men- emotionally. But when it came to being who he is and like making well, decisions. Well, it was complicated. You know, yeah, he just would complicate. I mean, these, the, like, the other things, though, is like, you know, when Rock Hudson came out or the Brady Bunch dad came out or he didn't, people were forced out and it was like, <gasps> they're gay. And it's like this black label, almost the scarlet letter, if you will, uh, that they're not allowed to be that. And I was like, well, that's not going to be me. I'm not going to be, you know, completely thrown under the the ringer uh, on, on, uh, national TV. So this is how I'm going to create my life, which was two wow. houses next door to each other. So when you first start dating, when did the discussion about marriage happen? And then when, and did you discuss kids while you were dating? Well, when we first met three, three steps into first meeting him, I, I was like, this is completely different than I've ever met this. I know right away that I feel like I don't believe in the before or afterlife or whatever. Um, and, or that, that, I'm sorry, I don't believe in, um, that we have been here before. Yes. And Previous so, life. right. Correct. And so, but the, the minute he walked up and we said, hello, I thought, I feel like I've known this person and I don't know why. And I feel like I've known him forever. And there's such this comfort that I've never experienced when I've met anyone else in my entire life. And we started walking to back to my place. And I was like, this is different. And uh, for the record, I told, I said that to you first before you said that to me. And then he was like, I felt the same the way. Same way. Like, well, that's I wasn't you. sharing stuff like that because that was, you know, I'm hooking up with this person and I'm not supposed to be with them because I'm supposed to be in this relationship that I've been in for so many years. Uh, and I'm like, I, I can't share my, I don't even share secrets about myself. So why would I share, you know, secrets about how I felt? So mm-hmm. that was kind of my mindset. <laughs> but when he said it, I was like, me too. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. And, so, and when did when did you guys start talking about marriage? We didn't. Again, I don't think back then it was. But it, we, yeah. there was a couple states that it was allowed, California no. and, and Massachusetts, and maybe some other. But but we started talking about it uh, like about a year because we got we got engaged like. 14 or 15 months after we met. So I think we started yeah. talking about it. Around and who pushed that year. discussion? I don't remember. I think it was just, uh, how do we feel about it? Or we could, I think maybe the discussion started, we can start getting married. What do you think about that? Yeah, because, because we were in New York City. And so oh, okay. we- so it, wasn't, it wasn't allowed uh, across the United States yet. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of like, as two gay- people um and you know you want to marry this person like you know you want to actually you want to be like officially with them and knowing that in the past gay people could only be partners you know Mm -hmm. so and then when it became legal in New York City, it was like, oh yeah, like we absolutely have to do this. And then I remember we were actually looking for venues in December of 2011. That's how I remember it was like right around 
yeah. a year when, when we just started talking about it. And then we got engaged in January, January of 2012. 2012. Yeah. So when I re- am thinking about my own relationship and how I visualized my future being when I would, uh, or when Brett and I first started dating, I mean, we probably had only been dating a couple of months when I brought up that conversation. Like, so in the, not trying to tip him off that I wanted to marry him, but <laughs> didn't want to show all, my car- show all my cards, but, um, but I definitely, you know, was like, so what do you think about kids? Do you think you'll have kids someday? Cause I'm trying to figure out like, is this the person that also wants to start a family and who, who started that conversation in your relationship? Probably me. That was you. Uh, I think um, because again, I, I, maybe the way I was raised, I was like, you're going to get married and you're going to have kids. And so well, if I'm not going to get married and, and I can't have kids, but I can start to get married, I'm like, well, I think people can start, gay couples can start having kids. So it's like, what do you think? And, and I felt that, you know, while we had only been together for a year and a half to two years that we had done so much together that our relationship was kind of you know, what do you think about it? Uh, because maybe it's the natural progression of, of what, who we are as people and as our relationship. And so, um, yeah. That's Did you know it. other um, couples, well, gay couples who had children? Well, that was, I think that was the, the, yeah. the springboard into making, uh, building our family or creating our family because we created them. <laughs> but um, we have been talking about it and then, Hurricane Sandy hit New York and we were forced out of our apartment. And then so we I had um, I I don't know if you know her. She just passed away. Her name is Patricia Moreno. I talked about her on my um, on my social media and stuff. But she was this incredible fitness icon. And she was um, she taught me a lot. She was a mentor when I was younger in fitness. And so because it was the hurricane and they lived in Jersey, she and her wife, she said, hey, you know, come on over, you know, see the kids. And they had one kid via, um, I mean, sperm donor. And they I think she was like one and a half. And then they had just had two more. So her wife carried the first one and Patricia had carried the second two, the set of twins. And so we went to their house and it was just incredible to see two lesbians living in this incredible home and and making a family and the way they communicated with each other. And it was, it just felt so real and so comforting and so normal. And so, oh my God ish, you know, it was just like all these wow factors Mm. happening in this time. I, th- I think also that, you know, I never realized the impact of when you see someone like yourself doing what you want to do, how impactful and how much it can, you know, change your life. It's, it's, you know, when Barack Obama became president and people are African-Americans are like, now we can do this, right? Say black people. Black people. Okay. Um, but it, it was a <laughs> moment of, of uh, this is a gay couple who are married and have kids. And it's like, that yeah. can actually happen. You see the and, possibility. Right. So it's like, well, let's try and find out more. And so he called the so doctor. So she introduced us to a doctor. She was like, <clears throat> hey, this is my doctor. Call this doctor. So anyway, I emailed them. And the next that day. was the next day. And then in January of 2013, I remember visiting the office. And that was like, holy crap. And we had no idea the journey and the road that that first visit would take us on. On that first visit was your assumption, well, nine months from now, we'll have a baby or two. He says yes, but my assumption was no, because at the end of the meeting, our fertility doctor sat us in his office and he said, "This this may not happen right away. And he told us about a client of his who was a single dad that was trying to have... um, or he was a single guy who was trying to have kids and it took him, I think six tries. So he was very upfront in my mind. He was very upfront. Like this could really take a while, but then he was also, you know, some people want and done because, mm-hmm. you know, you guys are healthy and you're probably going to pick a really healthy surrogate and, 
an egg donor. So the, it's funny. The only thing I remember about that conversation that we had in January in his office was, so I'm going to let you know that this may not be an e- easy process. Like it may take you a while. And I thought we're healthy. <laughs> we're blessed with some, you know, we have money and have you seen us? We got exactly like, I mean, people come on. We're high performers. Uh, was, we will, we will crush this. We will crush this and we will have enough crushable ability that we will be able mm-hmm. to help others. Yeah. Uh, and then when he said that, he's like, so this may not work out the way you wanted to. I was like, <laughs> bless his heart. This is going to work out just fine. And it, that, that was, I just remember that specifically. So yeah. um, the, the journey starts can you, what's, what's step one? Step one is paperwork. You got lots and lots and lots and lots of mm-hmm. paperwork. It's, it's basically an intake um, form, <laughs> forms. It's a booklet that you have to basically fill out. There's tons of questions and, you know, they really need to get to know who you are because I've never obviously been through the adoption process, but it has to be somewhat similar. Like they, mm-hmm. and, but this is like super medical heavy too, because we have to get tested for everything. There's blood work, there's, you have to test your sperm. Like, you know, we had to go into what we called the inspiration room and then, (laughs) you know, get a report on how viable our sperm is. Right. So Mm -hmm. it was, it was just, the first part of it was really wild because Mm -hmm. you just had, it was just like very medical heavy and um so and you're was, learning right yeah. shocked at how i mean it was the i said i say kids are the craziest science project i've ever been a part of but before that it was learning all about having kids and our body and i was blown away it was better than any sex ed class I'd yeah ever it was taken. it was it was amazing so that was like the first i would say month was meeting the doctor f- getting interviewed filling out paperwork, getting all the medical tests that you could possibly imagine you would need to get. Um, and then this, and then the next step was, okay, here's some websites go, you know, it's basically like going on match.com and trying to find your egg donor. Who's so you didn't to- go to the meet. Did you ever consider talking to somebody who was already in your life about being an egg donor? not an egg well so you're not allowed oh so, really yeah well it was something like i don't well not that you're not allowed but you it wasn't it you were, i feel like they were more like okay here are some websites and that you go to to find it was advised owner. that you don't uh, use oh, someone that makes know. sense yeah that makes sense that that would really i'm sure and actually have complication yeah, legally there, you know, we had lots of contracts and I remember the statement, I don't, uh, from our lawyer, she was like, so even though we have this contract, there is still a possibility that things could happen that, uh, even though we put it in the contract that things could happen and you're like, yeah, well, then why are we doing this contract? But, yeah. but before the contract phase, it was more of like here go. And I remember going on the website and you literally could put in you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, five, six. That's you, crazy. That you, to me, I'm sorry. That seems like that would be the funnest part. It was, I mean, it was super fun to me. I was like, boom, 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 like picking all these people. And then, you know, we had one of the, the bigger conversations with that part of it was the race of our. Oh, talk to us about that. Owner. Because that's something I, I mean, a lot, some of these questions I've asked you, I've never asked that question. I didn't even think yeah, about that so let's let's hear what that conversation sounded like all right i'll go and then yeah. you know i don't want to over talk but um i think what was really interesting about it is you really or i did i don't know what his thoughts were i know i've mentioned this to him but you really try to find like okay what woman would m- make our kids somewhat look alike that was mm. the first thing i'm like I was like, oh, I want a Moroccan woman because, you know, I'm, you know, I know my ethnicity and, you know, he's white with blonde hair and blue eyes. I'm like, they can meet in the middle and they could both be like, maybe have the same. They could be us. Yeah. yeah, Or maybe the same color skin. And yeah, but they would look like each other and we would be their parents. It was like, so it was that. 
And Scott did not want a, a white woman. He was like, no, I don't. He was like, I want, you know, he was like, I want a woman that is, you just, I don't know why you didn't really want a white woman. I think you just wanted something. That represented us because yeah. of the bond that we had in our relationship. I just felt that there, that there's so much of us that could be put into like something that was a mix of us. Yeah. So we had all these. So the first woman we chose though. So, I mean, I, while I was like, I would love to have, a woman that would birth uh, that would help us make kids that would kind of be a mix of us. I was also like, I want a black girl, a black girl. Cause I just like, I like if I was a straight man, I definitely would, I would probably 90% be with a black woman just because yeah. like, Oh my gosh. Like I just, <laughs> they're just like incredibly beautiful. Like I just, not that you know I agree with you. No, I agree with not you. Not that you know, I love my white girls too, and my Asians and my <laughs> Mexicans and my Boricuas or whatever. I love everyone, but I, I just like it. love black women. I'm just like, yeah. oh my goodness. So the first woman that we chose, which I think I chose almost everyone, she's this black girl, and she was just like, Oh my god, she, she was, was she was beautiful. She was a bodybuilder too. She was like a bodybuilder. Uh-huh. And um but I will say this though. I mean, it's it's not as easy as putting in all these things and you think some someone like 10 people are gonna pop out that you want. It uh, you know, you really so you start with your list and then you, no one comes out and you're like, oh, okay, well, let's take out this and let's take out this and let's take out this, and then you have it's to it's like really doing a Zillow compromise. house search almost. Well, like it's you a, want it's two a, bathrooms or, or or one bedroom. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I'll take you a step further. It's almost like this might sound really crazy, but you know me, I'm crazy. It's like doing a Zillow house search, but more like, okay, we're trying to find somebody to marry and we yeah. both have to like the way they look. Yeah. Like, so I'm- when that's interesting, because you're obviously not going to spend any time with this person. So, and I've never been through this process. Are you just give me yes or no's. Can you ask about height? Yes. yes. Eye color. Yes. yes. Um, uh, Faith. Yes. Um, IQ. Yes. yes. You know, you know, their, their education, education level, family, family history, dad history, mom history. Really? You can ask about the, they'll show you baby pictures. Um, there's a like, write up like wow. you, it's like match.com. They, there is a write up there's several a, pages, like eight, yeah. 10 pages where they have to fill out information where you're like, you know, and there could be something in there. You're like, eh? off the list. Well, and today, plastic surgery is so common. I always say like, you know, sometimes you, especially here in LA, people probably get married and then they have a child and they're like, what is that? (laughs) Because the person they're marrying doesn't even really look like (laughs) the person. Well, I will tell you that they have to, like in most of the egg donor websites, they have to have two kid pictures and like there's like coming of age. Okay, that makes sense. That they have to have. I would be and selected by no one if they could see my photos from like basically <laughs> age 10 till I don't know, 21. Okay, so so you put in all this information and are there things that were absolute no's for the two of you? Like, I don't know. I can't even think of something, but you're like, oh, this person's perfect except. Height, I think. Really? I oh yeah, I think the biggest one was height so you wanted did you want a a woman who was taller yeah because like i think it's just like you know my mother was tall my mom is tall Mm -hmm. his mom isn't tall Mm -hmm. i don't but you know we also thought like athletics well it's an opportunity to give your child every advantage aside from you know what they're going to get just from the two of you being their parents you know it's it's kind of an interesting concept it's yeah but it's also like interesting but also a little dangerous if you think about it it's just like really strange it's a strange process because i think that in some ways it could be unhealthy too yeah because you don't ever have to meet this person and in some ways it could you can feel like you're being judgmental you're like no Mm -hmm. i don't want her i don't want her and it just kind of felt really weird Mm -hmm. but i will say that throughout the process and i don't want to jump ahead because i want you to ask your questions and you know how you need them but I will say, you know, we had s- six Five, egg six, donor. One, two, 
two, three, five. We have five egg donors. So over that time, we chose a, the first one was a black girl. Then we chose a redhead. She was a tall redhead, like brilliant. I think her, like her education level was like super out of this world, but she was also a dancer and like in theater mm -hmm. and redhead. She was beautiful. Like, oh my gosh. I was like, oh my God. And you know, I'm just like, so we did that. And then who was the third? There was, she was like a, she wasn't Latin. She was like, more oh of, yeah. She was more of like a, I don't, maybe Moroccan. Like, I think like she was yeah. very, like some, like, I don't know, Middle Eastern or whatever. She was beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then I forget who the fourth I person don't, I was. Did, yeah. I forget the fourth. Person. No, I remember the fourth person. She was a not very tall Latinish. Mm female because we were talking about nicole because yeah. our, our sister-in-law uh we were like oh we should get my look like nicole because my brother's <laughs> kids are beautiful you know oh that's so funny <laughs> and then the so, last one was and was then the last amazing. one was the was the final yeah girl she's mostly black but yeah so when you say you had uh five different egg donors not all at once do you have to go through the entire process almost to and what does that look like so I, when you say the entire oh. process are you going well walk me through that what does that look like how do you know that oh this person isn't going to work out so you they uh, like the first egg donor uh you they go through the all the meds and things and then they donate and then you take all their eggs and you but let me explain that process because that's really very very important so for people who don't know basically what happens is the doctor tricks a woman into thinking she's pregnant basically she in a way like she, she has to drop eggs so it's almost like putting her on a period on her period on her ovulation cycle so that as many follicles can open as possible so that he can, or she whichever doctor it is can go inside and get the eggs out and so sometimes people only get six eggs our first egg donor got 83 eggs the first time which is what un yeah normal of. people uh just the get 12. three you know some you know three but, or six or whatever but no she, they get 12 like they'll they can extract 12 eggs but once you fertilize them it goes down to like maybe two mm. or three are viable so and so that process just if you just so the egg donation happens there's a lot of eggs uh a lot not as in a lot but as in there is a a group of eggs um, and for us, we then split them. Oh, sorry. They decided which ones were viable. And then um, by testing them? No, the look. Yeah, the, the embryologist will look at the eggs and then if it's healthy, keeps it. If not, basically they... they so then we, so let's say if they, she donated 83 eggs, we then drop down to 50 because so many of them weren't, well, some of them weren't. And so we split 50, 25, 25. We then, um, the doctor takes our sperm and puts them with the eggs and then um, they will then turn into an embryo and they'll grade those. And so from 25, we went down to 12 and 13, I think. Yeah. And then from 12 and 13, we have them gen genetically tested and we um, figure out which ones are boys and which ones are girls. And so from there, we went from like 83 eggs to maybe two embryos that were boys and three embryos that were girls for me. And for him, it was like three and two or something. So, you know, you start off with this process of like, oh my God, we have so many eggs. We're going to, we're going to kill it. We're crushing it again. <laughs> and you you're down to like two and you're like, wait, how did that happen? But we still got two and, you know, because we wanted boys. So we thought, okay, we'll put, you know, we'll now take these two embryos and put them in and boom, it should work. And that's why it's really important for people who want to go through this process. This is so important. You, like Scott was saying, like you go from this many eggs to this many eggs and you are immediately emotionally attached to every step of the way. You're I like, you. I have this many eggs. And in a way you feel like I have 83 kids and then your kids die. You know, like that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. And so I, and the reason why I say that is because you really, when you really want kids, you get really attached really quickly. The minute a woman becomes pregnant, especially if, you know, 
she and her wife or she and her husband have been trying to make this happen, you are attached immediately. Mm -hmm. We have, in my opinion, we have the joy of being able to make this happen outside of the body. This, you as heterosexual people who have babies uh, traditionally through sexual intercourse and the process of ovulation and it all works out, you don't have that. Right. So you are like, in, in, in a way, a, um, a blind spot in the, in, in the most respectful way. You're kind of like, OK, we had sex. We wait. We get to go into the inspiration room, look yeah. at porn, watch bad, look porn. at all, <laughs> watch bad porn. We have a good time because we're like, we don't have to we don't have that like we have to have sex now. And, you know, yeah. we we don't have to have that. We're having sex because we want to have a kid. We don't have that. So we have all these things, in, in my opinion, that are working in our favor. Our doctor sounds, you know, it's day three. Like, look at the embryos. There were, you guys don't have that. So it's really important for if you if you go through this process to understand, like, while you know and you get that step by step process, it's very heavy. It's, it's no, it's no, it's not heavier than what yeah. traditional heterosexual couples would go through, you know, cause you just don't know. And you're in a waiting game, waiting to see if you miss your period and the, you know, the right. whole thing, but it is, it's a process of emotions that people really need to be ready for. And one thing that I realized we kind of skipped is that, you know, we went from finding the egg donor. We didn't talk about the money you have to put down for deposit. We didn't talk about the contracts that we have to get to sign. And we didn't talk about, okay, now that we have her ready to donate all the meds that she's got to, you know, take needles and put them in her and, you know, not have sex with um, her, her spouse or her partner or whatever, because oh, if yeah. she has them oh, like it completely, and this is over the course of one or two like one month I think or, a month or month so. and a half. And our, our first egg donor was in the fitness. Like she couldn't work out. Like it's all, it's a lot. And it completely, she showed on social, uh, her body, the way it changed and bloated and everything. So, but then, you know, now they got the eggs, <clears throat> we didn't talk about the process of selecting, um, and, uh, surrogate. Cause like we, that is like, we kind of yada yada up to there and putting stuff in, but now, you know, again, there's the money, there's the contracts there's in this contract, we have to say, okay, if this happens to you, we, you know, if you lose an ovary, uh, we have to pay you this money. If you, you know, lose a kidney, it's this amount of money. If, you know, you wow. do this, I mean, like we actually put a price tag, sadly, in the contract that if something happens to the surrogate while you're going through this process, we pay this amount. We actually had to take out wow. a life insurance policy on the surrogate just in case something happens. I so, don't think people and, have any idea that there's so much, there's so many layers to this. It's so many. And, you know, it's interesting as we're talking, I'm remembering that, Scott handled more of the contract stuff, kind of what he does the for our, our lives <laughs> and, right, right, and the right. bills and everything. And I was the science. I can tell, I, I couldn't believe, I mean, he knows too, but I, I did like a deep dive into the science behind this and the emotion, the emotional strain behind this. That's the other thing that people don't, cause like, you don't know that you don't know the egg donor, but you really care about her. Yeah. Because you just did match.com and hopes that this is going to be the, the mother of your child. Mm -hmm. And even when she, like some people, some people can are distant from it, but that's not us. We're like, we asked the doctor, how's the egg donor doing? Uh, you know, is yeah. she this? Is she that? Is she sad? Because it didn't work because a lot of these egg donors too, not while they may be doing it for money. I'll, I'll skip to our final egg donor. Like she was very specific that she, would love for an LGBT couple to have it, she uh, to to have these kids. She wow. did, and a lot of women lie on their application just by changing of the name. Our egg donor did not lie on the application. She was like, "This is it." A lot of people go on to say they don't want LGBTQ. So when you have someone that's like, when you see why do you want, so why do you want to do this? The when their first answer is because I just think that everybody should be able to have a kid. You know, like that is like so powerful and amazing, you know, for you no, know, everybody should be able to do this. And that's the sec surrogate and the egg donor. Mm. But you get to learn so much about these people. And so it is, it's, it's just, it's, it's really emotional from like, 
people you don't meet, people you know a little bit, their families. I think most people probably assume that, um, you know, just at face value without giving it much thought that your egg donor was also the person who carried for you. So what, at what point in the stage do you select or find someone to carry for you and carry so, twins? So you have, <laughs> Good question. You, you find the egg donor, I think first, and then at the same time, you're kind of trying to find someone to be a surrogate. That in itself is a whole nother ball of a podcast channel, whatever. It's a whole nother thing because uh, you, that is speed dating at its finest. It is, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to our, our first surrogate. Um, the doctor had someone that, uh, that could wanted to do it and was willing and able. And so we got her number, we got on a phone call and chatted with her. I remember, I think we were in bed when it happened and it was like, okay, let's do this. And you're like, all of a sudden you are more than two feet jumping head first into a situation where it's kind of like our relationship true. okay <laughs> uh, where you you don't even know this person this person's goal is to help people have kids and so now you have to figure out after you've had a one hour conversation how we're going to move forward you have to do the contract you know you have to meet the family their family because surrogates you can't be a surrogate unless you've already you have to have already had, you, had kids you have to have had kids and you have to not want any more and that's why every single surrogate has to go through um, a mental health evaluation and a, a psychology and the husband or the partner of the person also you make it you said that you know it has to be that way it's not like a law is it i mean I, i'm assuming what you're referring to when you say you need to make certain that this person's already had children. I, that's a recommendation. I would assume that there no, are people no, no, out no. there who are like, really? In certain the states, law? I, don't, I don't know if it's nationwide, but every, every surrogate we had, they had to have. Because the thought is if they have not had kids at the type of at birth, they will take the child. Now, now, here's the thing. If you don't do it via contract, like if we came to you and we're like, yo, Shalene, we want okay. another kid. Can you carry this real quick? Right. <laughs> you know, then no one would know and no one would care because we're doing this, you know, you and Brett agreed to do this for us. Right, right, right. right. But if when you go through a contract, because you have to cover your tail every mm. step of the way and it's money involved every step of the way. Interesting. It's very expensive. Is that something <laughs> so, that and, you know, maybe this is too personal, but is that something that people negotiate or is there a flat rate? You nego they negotiate. Everything is negotiable. Uh, so once you know. one is it, is it, that's the surrogate, right? One surrogate might be this is my price if it's a, a single. It, it, this is my price if it's um, multiples. Um, and then you're and do you look and say, well, gosh, we would really like this person to be our surrogate, but they are a million dollars or whatever. Mm -hmm. Even egg donors, if they've had six, so what if, if an egg oh. donor has had a successful birth because of the egg, they can charge more. I think our egg donor, because she donated for us twice, because the first time we were with another uh, surrogate, she wasn't able to get pregnant. And then the sec our doctor, because we had switched doctors, which we can talk about, but excuse me. Um, and our doctor was like, no, like these eggs are amazing. It's definitely your surrogate who you whatever. So, um, you know, you just so yeah. So else. so egg donors can charge more if their eggs are successful, and surrogates can charge more because uh, if they've had successful pregnancies. We had you know the gamut. We had uh, someone who had had kids but had never done been a surrogate before, and then we had the Super Bowl of sur surrogates where she had had eight kids via surrogacy, and you know it was us, not us versus her, but I mean because we chose her, but. Um, uh, you know, everyone and, and she could charge more than others because she was successful. So, yeah. And just like a side note, because we had five surrogates, if we had five egg donors, we had six surrogates. I think it was six, egg donors, five surrogates. but anyway, like we that. are, I think there's only one that we probably don't talk to at all. Like if they were to text that we would, they wow. wouldn't text. So like our first egg, our first surrogate was the woman that our doctor knew who was amazing. Her name was Emily. I don't need to give her last name. Incredible. Her husband, husband. still, I think, sends text. Like he's so yeah. nice. Family, they had five kids. Like our second egg donor was my, our sister-in-law, my brother's wife at the time. 
Our Love third, her. She's our, still in our lives. Yep. Our third surrogate was, it was a woman that tried to be our surrogate, but she had endometriosis, yes. remember? Yeah. Super nice woman. Our fourth surrogate was the Super Bowl of surrogate. Her name no, was... No, no, no. Uh, we, we tried with Alicia. Oh, but... Oh, yeah. So then one of my friends, good friends, his wife, flew to the doctor to try and do it for us. Then we had the Super Bowl of surrogates that he spoke to before. Uh, incredible woman. Amazing family. And then finally, it was our surrogate, Ashley, Ashley who actually was our third-party coordinator in the second office she read our file and was like, I want to be a surrogate. But the reason why I'm saying that is because all except one, like if they called, we could cut up with FaceTime a couple. Most of them are kids. If, if it's their birthday, you know, because we still consider them to be a part of the process. But as, as amazing as that is, it that is also so emotional. Like, oh, I can't imagine that, that is like. Because, you know, when you go in, you're, you, you, you're diving head first into this relationship. You are intent. This, this relationship for, I don't know, however long they were. Sometimes it was two months, three months, six months to a year and a half or whatever. Like you are in it. Like, you know, there's texted with Sean because he was, he was the emotional and I was the business. You know, he would get texts from the surrogate, you know, I'm feeling this way. I don't know about this. I'm, you know, whatever. And he's like, very, very good. And then if it didn't work out, we're like... We now you have to break, break up. up and uh but you I, I mean i hate to to bring it up but it's something that isn't possible for a lot of people because they just couldn't afford to continue the process i would assume each each one of these surrogates which is it's wonderful you still have a an emotional personal relationship with them but first there's a financial relationship and i assume each surrogate had to be paid whether it was a viable pregnancy or not I will say to some degree. Yes, I will say, though. It's only one that I don't really know, but I bet you that these women would have done it for free. Like if we said we couldn't afford it anymore, like we got that lucky, like you're so correct when you say that. But like we got lucky with people like they literally were like, no, you need to have kids. It wasn't for financial gain like what our our final surrogate was like she her husband was like no you ain't doing that like a lot of times they would just be like i want to help you Mm -hmm. and it just happened to they were so oh i wish i could explain this it's like it was not about the money for most probably all except for one it was not about the money like they were like i want to do this for you and the emotional toll that it took on them I mean, our sister-in-law had a miscarriage like and for a year and a half and we weren't allowed to pay her. So she wasn't allowed to be paid because she lived in Jersey. And so her and my brother for a year and a half didn't have sex. Oh, my gosh. They did that for us. Wow. You know, and that's this is where, like, for me, it gets emotional because it's like and they're not married anymore. Wow. You know, it's like it's it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And so you started this process in 2013. And when was the first time you got a call that we have a viable pregnancy? Uh, this 2014? November, November of 2013, because Nicole got a, oh, yeah. uh, uh, Nicole got pregnant. I remember her calling us and being like, oh my God, I hate the way this soup smells. You know, and she was like, this soup sucks. And we all got so excited because, you know, she had kids already. So she, you know, she knows her body when she's right. pregnant. And we got like super excited. And that was like really wonderful because it was like, not that we didn't want Emily to get pregnant, but it was like my brother's wife, my brother's doing this for us. Like, this is amazing. You know, it was like, you know, and then uh, not to be Debbie Downer, but you know, six weeks in. It wasn't even that because well, I mean, it was six weeks. Oh yeah. 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 It was yeah. six weeks. And right. if you really know the, the, the when, when pregnancy actually starts. So yeah. but that's a whole science lesson for people who don't understand that. But, um, so when some, when a woman's six weeks, y'all, it's not that she knows she was pregnant for six weeks. It's like from right. the ovulation point, whatever. But anyway, she was spotting in the shower. She was just like, you know, something's, something's not, not right. right. And then, you know, and then, so, you know, she went to the doctor and Scott flew there and met her there and she had to get a DNC and like, I wasn't able to be there. It was a lot. So it's just like this 
crazy roller coaster God. of emotion. Now, we, I'm going to say this. I know a few people, couples and singles, who have had one and done. One and done. Nine months, boom, they got pregnant, they picked the embryos, they were amazing and go. But a lot of people's stories are like ours. And that's why when I, when I talk to women and couples who struggle with fertility, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm so empathetic and sympathetic because I'm like, I, I understand what you're going through. He, we do, we yeah. both do. When was, th- that was uh, in November, 2013. When was yeah. the next time you had a viable pregnancy? It was Charlene in 16. Mm. Wow. It so was, you waited another three years before there was success. It was April <sighs> of 2000. Well, not wait. Like we were still going through the process. Like, every, you know, we would try and, and um, we're lying. We're lying. The first time was Emily. Her second transfer. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was right. our first, ex, first surrogate. It was a second transfer because then she started making like, she put the yeah. board up and she was like, she was so you know, cute. you know, I don't know if it was like two weeks, three days pregnant, you know, like, so she, it was her, but it was so early that it was more of like, um, it wasn't like so far. And like, we weren't looking for the heartbeat yet. It was like this very mm-hmm. initial stage where she tested positive with her hormones. And then it was Nicole. And then we tried and tried and tried. And then, uh, May of 2016, our Super Bowl woman <laughs> got pregnant and she was pregnant, but it was a like chemical pregnancy. Mm. So there's ectop, ep- ectopic pregnancy, there's chemical pregnancy, there's like, there's so many like different things, but you know, you hold on to the fact that like, oh my goodness, this is going to happen because there are a lot of women out there who get pregnant. They don't even know that they're going through all this stuff. And somehow it works out. Like it just, it works itself out. So you keep holding on to that hope. That and roller coaster then, ride going up and coming down and going up and coming down, uh, takes a real toll on a couple emotionally. Did it impact your relationship? The two of you? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh God. Yes. 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 I, I think it came to a, a culmination uh, we were in Miami for an event and it was, um, uh, in the morning we had gotten into a fight, uh, because we knew that some test results were coming and we weren't sure. And it was, you're just- so anxious, Shalene, it is terrible. And, and he's dealing with somebody who's like completely emotional at this point. And in my head, I'm like, I didn't want to fucking do this. Like, yeah. I didn't even want to have these kids. And now like, we're arguing, we're fighting. I'm constantly stressed out. I have to like all these relationships, like you're now yeah, in an emotional state of like, and you're dealing with somebody who is like the ice princess who <laughs> wants to, ha- you know, he wants to have the relationship underground. Like I'm going to live this great life yeah. out here, but I can hold it in. And I'm like, why don't you fucking say so? You know, like yeah. you're like, no, we're in it. Like we're in it. Yeah. We're in it. <laughs> yeah. So it was there ever a point at which you're like, we got to call it off. At least we have to take a break for a little while because this is just too much for my emotional state. It was, it was in Miami where we were like, if this doesn't work, it's, we are stopping. And uh, the, the call was coming in. Um, our egg donor had donated a second time. Uh, yeah. Our final egg donor had donated a second time. And we had some viable eggs and embryos and the Ashley, who was the third party coordinator for us at the doctor's well, Alicia office. had just went. Oh, there. that's so right. Alicia, who was oh. one of my best friend's wife. She had just gone and was like, Hey, I'm, go-, you know, she filmed it. She's like, I'm doing this test. Like I'm hoping it's oh my God. To, I feel to so be bad. our surrogate. Yeah. And so Anyway, so she, so we were waiting to get a call from her to see if she could do it because I don't even think she was going to charge us. Like, I think she was just like, I'm going to do this for y'all. She had one kid who was a teenager. I'm not doing this. I'm not having any more kids. Let's do this for y'all. Yeah. So so we were going to get a call to see if uh, Alicia was viable uh, to, be our surrogate. to be our surrogate. And so we got into a massive fight in the morning. He went out and did his thing. I played tennis. I need to go play tennis. And he got a massage, I think. And so I'm back at the hotel waiting for this phone call. Ashley calls and she says, 
So um, uh, Alicia cannot be your surrogate uh, because her lining doesn't doesn't grow the way it's supposed to. It or... wasn't the correct amount of cinnamon. Right. You know the whole and so Ashley was like, what are you going to do? And I, I, I almost broke down. I was like, well, what the fuck can we do? Like we are at ground zero again. We are at literal ground zero. We don't have a surrogate. We have an egg donor, but it doesn't really matter. So it's like, I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, she, I was like, I don't know what we're going to do. And Sean and I got in a fight this morning. So we're probably not going to do this thing again. And she said, uh, I want to be your surrogate. And I, I was literally, what? 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 Like, we uh, don't even know you. I don't even, we don't even know you. I don't and, remember meeting you. Like, like, what do you mean? Anyway, and why, 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 why do you even know the process? And she's like, yeah, I'm the third party coordinator. I understand how I was. I've always wanted to be a surrogate. I, I talked to my husband. Um, I've always wanted to be it. He finally said, yes, I read your file. I know all the stuff that you're going through and I want to be the person that helps you. And I, wow. I was like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Like this is, I, I said, I have to talk to Sean. Let me, I mean, I said, do you, oh, wait, do you, are you sure you know what you have to go through? And she's like, absolutely. It's like, this is what she does for a living. So mind you, before he tells you this next part of the story, uh, when we went, because we had goats, our doctor recommended us to a colleague of his that was in Texas. We were in New York and this doc, this fertility clinic was in Texas. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is the woman that took us to our inspiration room in Texas, where in, in Texas, we couldn't be in the same room. In New right. York, we could be in the same room in Texas. We were in separate rooms. But what we didn't know is because, you know, now you're just like, I'm meeting people like I got a meeting. I got to see how Another much money one. I got to pay. Yeah. So anyway, we don't even remember her. Sure. Right, okay. So, so she says, you know, I want to be your surrogate and oh, by the way, um, we have viable embryos that we just got from, um, your second egg donation. And so, you know, if you're interested. And so I said, oh, I got to talk to Sean. So Sean comes home. I pull him to the, the hotel to the back to the hotel and it's probably I, still, you know, mad. Yeah. Of course. Holding a grudge so, from the morning fight. <laughs> So it's probably like three or four o'clock in the afternoon and uh, we had been filming some of this. And so I brought him in and I started filming and I was like, babe, also I have news. And I said, so um, Ashley called today and he's like, you know, how's Ashley? He's great. Um, we have embryos. You got these. I got these. Oh, that's great news. Um, and I said, I think I told you that Alicia couldn't be the surrogate. Yeah, I was and it's like, okay, great. You know, what do we do now? And I said, well, Ashley wants to be our surrogate. He's like, Ashley? I said, he said, Ashley from the office, Ashley? Because <laughs> I was like, Ashley? I was like, yeah, she must be a surrogate. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, yeah, she just offered on the phone. Like, what do you think? And she's like, yeah, let's do it. And so that then begins the process of another round of like, so you're excited, but you're also at this point a little, I want to say numb. jaded, like numb, no, I'm, numb. I'm, I numb. Was numb because I was like, okay, here we go again. Mm -hmm. But this is going to be the last time. Like yeah. he is literally um, put up with me. Like we're going to do this. Like we were, you're, we're a team. Like, you know, we're athletes. We can, we can win this game. We're in overtime mm -hmm. and this, you know, it's our 15th overtime, but we're going to, we're going to pull it out in the end. And so he said, okay. And I think she went through one, one month of trying, uh, and it, she didn't, she didn't try. She went through, through one month of getting her body ready as right. a surrogate, because that's a whole other process. And so it was just like, there wasn't anything wrong with her. It's just that there was some sort of bleeding that happened. I believe that the doctor was just like, there's nothing wrong. I just right. want to wait three more weeks so I can get this right. You know, because oh, yeah. she had had three kids, you know, she was she's a great, you know, candidate for pregnancy. She I don't she had, didn't have any problems. And she was like, she understood. But the she's process. small. So we were like, you sure you want to carry <laughs> two babies? So, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the questions that uh, people submitted and, you know, I want to thank you guys because you don't have to talk about this. There, You know, when you're in the public and you share everything, Sean, I mean, you've written books about your childhood and the abuse that you experienced. And I mean, you're just really an open book. Both of you are. But I also think, you know, we're all also entitled to have certain pieces of us that are ours and we um, we don't have we're not obligated to share those things. So I just want to thank you before we go much further. Thank both of you for just sharing this whole process with us. It's it's really remarkable. It's going to help so many people. Um, I don't think any, I don't think people realize like what a long period of time this was and how emotionally 
upsetting and the roller coaster that the two of you were on because you always, you know, put out to the public uh, this very happy, ex- vibrant personality where you're lifting everyone else up, you're motivating everybody else. But that had to have been a really difficult time. Yes. I have to imagine that there are days where you're just like, I just, I can't. I can't be that person for everybody else when we're experiencing this and, and the devastating news each time you find out it didn't work. When the two of you decided that you wanted to have boys, I want to ask that question. Was there ever a point at which you thought, well, let's have um, both sperm be uh, Sean's or both be Scott's or to do one boy, one girl? Like, how did that decision come to be? So, so... Initially, you know, Scott wanted 11 kids. I'm just going to put that out there. And I was like, no, that's not happening. I was like, we can have an even amount, but it won't be anywhere near that. But um, so we just always had a dream of having two boys. Like when we talked about it, like, oh my God, it'd be so great to have two boys. So the first time we put in two boys. And the second time I think we put in two boys. And then we were like, okay, let's put in two girls. And then one time, I think we put in like three girls of me. We were just like, let's just put three that's girls. That's all we had left at the time. Because I'm the only one. I was like, let's, well, we had boys. We were like, let's just put girls in. And he, oh, I, I didn't know this. And he didn't have any. And then we were like, okay, let's put one boy and one girl. And then, and then it got a little tense because it was, I think the second before the last time we put two boys in of only my embryos because I'm the only one that had embryos that were viable from the from the batch and so oh, okay it, it's so weird because you're just like well I want these I want these kids but I'm just like ah but then like not that we would treat them any differently but like both of them will be mine and it's like but we, we're definitely going to do it again so we can get his DNA here so it was a whole gamut. It it, with- it, it, those are conversations like, you know, because when you start again, it goes back to the very first conversation we had with our doctor. He's like, this may not go the way you want it to go. And I'm like, this guy's fucking crazy, but it didn't. And so it's like, okay, you can only, it's like checking the, checking the box for the Zillow house or, or trying to find your egg donor. It's like, okay, what are we going to uh, 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 compromise on now and move and do, you know, what's the goal? The goal is to have kids. And so it's- I was low key when we did put in the girls a, the couple of times, I was low key, like hope. And I was like, oh man, I could do like, I'm definitely gonna learn how to do hair and like all this stuff. <laughs> but I got Sander who likes to right. do hair, so. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so. Okay, so so now um, take me to the uh, call that you get that she's pregnant. It's at your birthday. Um, 2017. Yeah, because we were on the tennis court and um, it was Sean's birthday and it was like, okay, what do you want? He had, I'd asked him the day before. I knew, so you transfer seven days in the past and we both knew subconsciously that we would find out on his birthday. And it's like, great. Like this is try number 12. Like, do I really want this to impact his birthday? Because it was- And I remember waking up in the morning. Do you remember? And- I don't know if you started the conversation or I started the conversation, but it was either like, I'm going to have a good birthday or I'm going to have a really great birthday. This news was not going to ruin the day. Like that was like this. I was just like, I'm not going to have a bad birthday because we already, we've already been down this road before. So I'm still going to have a good birthday. So I remember saying that in the morning. So, you know, we started doing all the things that you love to do. And then we go to tennis and uh, for some reason, I, oh, I think I got a text message from Ashley while we were on court. She said, uh, call me. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, here we go. Again, try 12. So I said, bay balls, let's go. And so uh, we walked off the court and uh, we were in a kind of a tennis clinic and we went to the far part because we didn't know if we were going to be happy or mad or whatever. And I said, hey, Ashley. And she's like, hi. You know, Ashley is an amazing person she can be a little dry boots uh on the phone which means she's you know doesn't she's just have, like hey what's she's up? like hey what's up <laughs> so i said how are you and she's like i'm okay and we're like fuck like she's not pregnant and i said so what's the news and she's like i'm super pregnant and we're like what we're like, what, what do you mean? mean i just got chills again like what do you mean she's like my numbers are through the roof which implies that she's pregnant with twins like, they were, like her number her eight 
HGC, HGC numbers were like, it was like 7,000, seven days in. And we talked to her and, you know, she's excited, but, you know, very cautiously optimistic. So our doctor gets on the phone oh, yeah. and he's like, you know, he's one of those people that are like, this is what I love to do. And we gonna have these babies. He just knew, like he was like, "We're having twins. These these are twin numbers." He's like, "Obviously, I want to tell you, like, we have to be a little cautious because of whatever." But he was like, "This is gonna happen. This is gonna happen." He just always from the jump when we first met him, he's like, "You're gonna get pregnant. We're gonna be good. Like, let's go. Like, what are we doing?" He really is. A, he really is. Not to say the other doctor wasn't amazing. He was also the same, but it was um, he. And so. He gets on and he's like, okay, you know, this is the next step. We're going to do these tests on these days and, you know, we'll see you whenever, you know, we'll get yeah. you the numbers. But every. Hey, 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 come here. Come here. Come here, Rocco. <laughs> Rocco. I remember landing in Turks and Caicos because we went there for my birthday. And when we landed, it was the next set of numbers that were going to be given to us. Oh and. So they were like 17. They were like 17. Kill the stock. I'm going I'm to hit mute so you can finish. <laughs> okay. Okay. They were like the numbers on the day we landed in Turks and Caicos for my birthday was 17,000. And then by the time we left Turks and Caicos, we got on a plane to Miami. We were flying from Miami back to either Dallas or Phoenix or whatever the flight was. And she emailed us the first ultrasound where you see like the two little black holes. And that was like, and Ashley, you know, of course she works in the clinic. And so she's like, you, you know, she knows how to do an ultrasound. She knows all the things. And she's like, I'm just going to go in and do an ultrasound on myself, which I don't know if we're incriminating her because you know, maybe she's not supposed to, but she did. And she's like, bingo, like, all right, this is, and I'm going to keep an eye on it because, you know, and so she would, she was, yeah, you know. it was kind of the joy of having someone who worked in the clinic because she would go in if she felt any weirdness or whatever because it was the first time having twins she would go in and then she would send us all these videos and we then saw when silas and sander were just skeletons like moving yeah. around it was like so creepy and we saw every problem from when they looked like gummy gummy bears <laughs> to like skeletons yeah. and then it got to a point where she was like as big as a house she was like, this is crazy. And her husband was like, Sean, this is your, these are your kids and you can be with her at 2 a.m. So me and Ashley, we like texted at 2 a.m. We got a recliner and I was there with her, you know, through the phone. He was sleeping, her husband, Michael was sleeping and I was kind of like her caregiver when she got toward the mm -hmm. later stages of pregnancy and it was getting close. Did you ever um, imagine that when the boys were born, did you worry like, what if they don't look like us? Or what if they, no. I, I don't know, you know, the comparison when you're having two boys, like, and, and the sibling rivalries, those kinds of things. Has that ever been an issue? No, we never, we never thought about any of that. It was just like, so amazing. And even when you see them today, they get out of, they wake up, and one of them would be like, brother, can I come in your bed, please? And then they get in there and they get under the covers and they're like, the, they have these amazing conversations. Like the other day they were outside, they pulled up chairs next to each other and they were like, how was your day? And they were just having this conversation. But then 10 minutes later, they're like, oh, I'm Papa's favorite. And then they're fighting and you know, so they're just typical siblings. Yeah. But I will tell you something really incredible happened this morning. So Silas was reciting something he learned and he said, uh, Papa, you have darker skin than me and that's okay. And, and brother, I can still like you. and I can still like you and brother has darker skin than me and that's okay. And I can still like him. And so we were just like, you know, where are you getting wow. that from? And we didn't understand. And then he was like, well, I learned that about Martin Luther King Day. And then he started telling us a story about something that he learned on Martin Luther King. Well, I got to give major props to our nannies because they really get them. And, you know, so then I was able to sit them on the bed and we had this really brief but intense conversation about skin color. And I made them repeat after me, say, you know, it doesn't matter someone's skin or what they like or who they are. 
everybody is great and everybody should be treated fairly. And they repeated the question. And so, and then, you know, I described to them, I was like, you know, this was what your surrogate looked like, the woman that helped us make you, you know, she was this, and this is why your skin looks like that. And, you know, they know that Papa made oh. Sanders and, and Dada made Silas. Okay. So they they Amazing. know this. So there's um, no secrets. And, and yeah. your, um, Ashley, she, is she still in their lives? Oh yeah. yeah. Every, every year for the boy's birthday, we fly her and her husband or, you know, just her out to see, definitely see the boys. And we would do it more if, um, you know, well, the pandemic, you know, oh, for, yeah. I guess yeah. a year or a year and a half, whatever that kind of messed up. Like the, the tradition. we just got texts from Ashley yesterday and she's like, hi, you know, hi fam. Hope you're well. And she, yeah, they, they were here just for their birthday in no, this past November. And, you know, she's like, but they know her. So what we did yeah. was, yeah. How do they refer? How do you refer to her? Auntie Ashley, Auntie okay. Ashley. And what happened when we lived in our old house before we sold it, you know, we had a whole kind of shrine in their room. So like it was her and her family and when she was pregnant and the belly. So they know she, they came from her belly and they know she helped, you know, Papa and Dada have them. And, you know, they, you know, randomly ask questions about it. So, you know, we just, we're just very open about. And the and the surrogate uh, is a surrogate in the boy's life. Do you have a comment? Oh, that's, that's actually you know the egg donor. Oh, that you mean the egg donor. Oh, sorry. The egg donor. My bad. Yeah. Uh, no, she has no, the egg donor is not allowed to know who you are. And, and it's not, I, I read the contract this morning because I figured you would ask. Um, so they are not allowed to pursue trying to figure out who and where their kids are there. If, wow. if there's a successful, um, and at 21, um, the boys are allowed to do what they want. They're allowed to reach out to her if they want to. And if we, how tempting if, is it for you to just go look at how amazing they are? Uh, it's because she is incredible. Oh, like this woman is in like, and this is going to sound so vain, but she's like the female version of me. <laughs> like, and I, I don't mean like the Dawn. incredible way, but like, You're so she, funny. but she's, she is, she's the, she's like you as a black woman. Like, and I know, <laughs> so I know that much sounds taller really, and much faster. <laughs> she's probably taller and faster, but she's like amazing personality. You know, she's into fitness, like the fashion forward, you know, Entrepreneur. loves gay people. Cause I like ghost follow her. Like, cause I know who she is, but she doesn't know who we are. And well, there's just, a really good chance if she's in fitness that she probably follows you. She doesn't. Hmm. So I don't know if she doesn't follow because she's like, I kind of know, and I don't want to get involved because it's really odd that this person doesn't follow me. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I like mean, I'm all that, but, right, I mean, but you know. if you're creeping on their stories or whatever, they're seeing <laughs> this, huh? This verified blue check person. Who is this? Yeah, I well, I mean, first of all, I just want to say to give you to the opportunity to address anyone right now who's struggling with their fertility and going through this process, any words of wisdom or something that would help them comfort them through the process? You know, I'm just going to say the thing that helped me the most. This was the thing that really helped me settle and even in the worst moments. And it is when our first doctor pulled us in his office and we were having the most terrible time. And he said, the people who are supposed to come into this world are going to come into this world. He said, we cannot rush the people that are supposed to be here. And when they get here, you'll know why they are the people that are coming to this world. And you know, it sounds so cliche, but like this world without Sander and Silas just would not be the same place. They are, I know everyone says this about the kids, but these kids, I'm like, they are so incredible. It is, I'm like, I cannot wait to see what they do with their lives. I just, they're gonna, I just can't wait. And so that was the biggest thing that helped me. I think that's a, I, I don't know that I could, piggyback I, I mean other than saying you know uh thing if you want something you have to fight for it and it, you may not have control over it and if it's going to happen it's going to happen 
uh, and you just got to keep going. And the last thing I'll say is, especially those who are in a relationship, um, you have to be like my father-in-law says all the time, soft on the person, hard on the problem. Because the couple times where we did get into the bad fights, we were hard on each other and not working together as a team to be hard on the problem. And so when we, when we started to say, well, it was that last time where we were just like, this is our last time we're doing this and we're going to work together to make this happen, not find blame in each other. Because the one thing I'll say, especially to women out there who may be a little bit older or who may have had some medical issues with their areas or men who may be have some sperm infertility issues, but you're on the cusp. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's, it's, it's what life is right now. And when, when I'll be very optimistic, when those people are come here for you, it's going to be the most amazing thing. So. It may not be the bro- the road you thought you were going to go on, but it's going to be the road that, that will lead you to where you are supposed to be. I'll say that too. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Well, this was incredibly inspirational. Um, your, your boys are, it's almost not fair. It's not fair <laughs> to the other parents, how freaking cute and adorable and smart and just yummy your boys are there. They, they just, they break the internet. I don't even know why you bother posting any of your speedo shaking your booty videos because <laughs> It just doesn't even compare to the joy and everyone is just hanging on for one more video of Silas and Sander. They are amazing, but they're amazing because you two are such students uh, and you, so you can just tell how devoted you are to being amazing parents. So I need to just go off for a little second here and say, I've loved you. We've been friends for more than 15 years and Sean and Scott, I, I love the two of you together as a couple. I knew like, this is a really solid couple. This is a healthy couple seeing you as parents has taken my love and admiration to you to a whole nother level of all the things the two of you have done together. I, I just, there's nothing I respect or am more in awe of than the way you parent. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you. inspirational. And, uh, I wish more people spend as much time as the two of you do, like really putting intention behind it and just everything that you do. These kids have so much going for them. And of course, you know, the family that they're surrounded by too is amazing. I, I love watching Bill's posts and your parents post, Scott, but, um, and, but just the way the two of you have used this opportunity, use this as an opportunity to help other people see that love is love and what it means to put your children first and to pour into them and let them be who they were born to be, not trying to mold them into anything in particular, but I just have to say, um, if you're not yet following Sean and Scott, I'm going to post links to their social media below. You should probably should follow uh, Bill too, because Bill posts some great videos <laughs> on the kids too. But um, it, it's truly, there's so much more. I, I could, we could go for another hour to just get your parenting tips. But what I'll have people do is, is follow the two of you and, and they, they'll see it in action. And I don't think there's anything more powerful than that. Oh, thank well, you. thank you. Thank you so much. It's we appreciate it so much. And obviously I can say a lot of things about you, or we can say a lot of things about you. But you're going to be on my podcast. So I'll say it on there. <laughs> I love it. Well, thanks you guys for being here. I'll put links to Sean's podcast below. Um, both of their social media platforms are super entertaining. You guys know how to live life to the fullest and you're amazing parents. Thank so you. thank you so much for being here today. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. We love you. Love you. All right, guys, don't forget if you're watching this on YouTube to make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, hit that like button, drop some additional comments here and and share some love for these two. And and of course, as I said, be sure to give them a follow on social media because you you will see amazing parenting in uh, in in the process. And it's it's so neat to see these two boys grow up. Thanks for being here, guys. We'll see you soon.